and we are now live. This is Doc Williams, DOC Williams, and I am talking about anatomy and physiology today. This is the review course for anatomy and physiology. Uh, just a little bit about myself, we'll talk about it in a second, but I am the instructor at Valley College and also I work at a few other schools and institutions, but today we're gonna to be reviewing for the class for anatomy and physiology. So thank you very much for joining us. It is about 12.35 a.m. So we're gonna be rolling through this. Uh, you can follow along in your SIN gauge book, but also take the time, stop this video when you need to, um, do screen captures, whatever you need to do uh, to, to learn, and also you can uh, find me later and ask me questions about anatomy and physiology, especially if you're a trainer, if you're gonna go into MA, all this kind of stuff. So uh, let's get this rolling, shall we? So I'm about to do a screen share. And you're gonna see something crazy for a second. Okay. And we're going to get started in this, okay? So today we're gonna to be specifically talking about out of the Cengage book for medical assisting, admin and clinical competency. So this is MED, uh, week number one for the anatomy and physiology overview. So welcome. Uh, what we've got on the docket today is first chapter nine, the uh, basically the anatomy descriptions and fundamental body uh, body structures. Say that five times fast. So what we're gonna do today, we're gonna talk about the basics and then we're gonna go right into the holistic approach of uh, looking at the body, which is skeletal, nervous system, and muscular all at the same time. So before we get started, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about myself and then we'll go from there. So hi, my name is Doc and I will be your teacher. So if you see me, I am not the man named Arnold Schwarzenegger in that picture. My name is Doc, so I'm the one on the right hand side. Uh, I am a medical instructor as well as a trainer. I placed uh, third in America's Next Great Trainer. It was a national competition and then I got to meet that guy, Arnold. Um, so that was awesome. I also do basically uh, a manual technician. So I'm a massage therapist, a physical therapist assistant, as well as a crime scene cleaner. That's all true. You can look at my licenses. So I have a very unique blend, a hybrid style of looking at anatomy and physiology in my different jobs, and uh, I hope to bring this to you. So let's get started. So the main thing is to learn about anatomy and physiology. We've got to know what that is, right? So anatomy is the study of physical structure of the body and its organs. So really, it's the bone structure and everything that makes up the body. So it's the framework. Then the physiology is the science of the function. So that can be the cells, tissues, and organs of the body. It explains how everything works together. So remember, it's important to know the anatomy and physiology, not just the anatomy, because if you don't know why it works or how it works, uh, you're missing 50%. And if you understand what it does, but you can't identify where it is, uh, once again, you miss out. So we're combining anatomy and physiology. Now also, we're gonna be talking about different descriptions of terms, how to talk about locations found in the body, and then also we're gonna talk about positions while standing, sitting, all that kind of stuff. So we'll explain all of those uh, directional positions as well. So let's get started. Before we can even talk about the different parts of the body, we gotta be able to describe uh, the terms, right? So to describe exact location, it's important for this because we're going to chart it. Now, if you're gonna be a medical assistant, depending on where you work, it's gonna really depend on what you do, but we're gonna talk about learning how to chart it, how to describe different uh, pathologies and study of diseases, and also problems that can occur on the body. And we need to do that with a set of words in that medical language. So we call it medical terminology. So right off the bat, when we look at this, um, this diagram, we see how it's first giving you a midline or the mid-sagittal line. That's gonna be straight down and cuts the body in half. 
Now from there, we can describe different things. For instance, let's look at the humerus right here. We're looking at first the humerus, this bone. We see its proximal end of the humerus, proximal meaning closer to or up towards something, distal away from the body. So that way, if we need to describe something on this bone, we can say something's proximal, proximal end of the humerus, or distal, away. Same way, if we look at the lateral ligaments of the knee, we can say either lateral, the outside, or medial, medi, uh, or middle. It's going to be closer to the middle. So when we find something that's abnormal, we can now use descriptions to define where it is. And if we do it in paperwork, if we chart it, a doctor, another healthcare medical professional can read what we're doing and then uh, be able to tell what's going on. Now, this is done by a few general things. When we look at these different terms, we see that we can have always pairs. So when we have proximal and distal, they're gonna be pairs. Medial and lateral are gonna be pairs. So proximal, nearest point of attachment. Distal, farthest from the point of attachment. So going back, proximal being right here, closest, distal, farthest away. We say that the proximal end, the closest or the highest point of one side in distal, the exact opposite, the furthest away of the humerus that it can possibly be. The same way as when we look at this, it says toward the midline and away from the midline. We can turn back and now look at, let's see, the kneecap or the patella. So if we're trying to describe that it's medial closer to the middle line, we're gonna say it's medial to whatever. We know that it's gonna be closer to that midline, that mid-sagittal line. And if we say lateral, we know it's more towards the outside of the leg. So we're always gonna have a pairing, like a yin and yang, you're always gonna have something, proximal and distal, and then you're gonna have medial lateral. That's two pairs. Going on, and those are just a few, there are tons of different ones that we'll talk about later, but those are the two basic pairs that we need to learn how to describe. Another terminology to describe the atomical directions are adding planes. So another line divides the body into upper and lower halves, it's saying. Finally, a line div divides the body into front and back. That's kind of confusing to me. Um, really, what we look at, we see that each part has something that cuts the body in a different way. So let's look at first the mid-sagittal line, right? So once again, if we go back to, that's going to be that midline, mid-sagittal that stays the same. Now, what we're going to do is add three planes. We're going to add first the frontal plane that comes across and it cuts the body from the, the front and the back. So imagine if there was a slice with a knife, it cuts the body in half. One being the anterior or the first or the front part of the body. And then if this frontal plane cut again, it would cut it back into the other one, the posterior or where your backside is. The other one would be your sagittal plane, which cuts right down the middle, and that cuts your, the body into a left and right half. So sagittal cuts right down the middle and makes it a left and right half. The frontal cuts, so you'd have a front and back side. And then the transverse cuts right through the middle, and that is if you just go cut right through, you would be able to see the middle part. So you have a frontal plane, a sagittal plane, and a transverse plane. A frontal plane, sagittal plane, and a transverse plane. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in week two, but that way we can describe different actions that happen in the body. Now, excuse me. <coughs> Whew. If we look at this, we see a couple things again, right? So we see anterior towards the front, and then posterior towards the back. Remember, that's going to be separating in the frontal plane. Anterior, the front. Posterior, the back. Now, another one is superior and inferior. Okay, and it says above the transverse plane and below. So if we see superior, closer towards the head, we usually say inferior towards the feet. So it's just giving you a relative position. 
Now they're saying they're making a hard and fast rule of right there, that's the transverse line. So it's gonna be above and below. But when you're describing it, yeah, superior towards the head, inferior towards the feet. Cranial, cranial, talking about skull, towards the head. So you might hear that as well. That's another thing that we might hear. Um, ventral, towards the front or the belly side. We hear it once in a while, but I would say anterior and posterior. Those two are wonderful. We hear all the time. Superior, inferior, and I'm going to go with cranial. Those are going to be the five that you hear a lot. Now, besides going on with the different directions uh, uh, of the body, there are certain body cavities that we should keep in mind. The reason we should care about the body cavities, that's where the, the organs are housed. And a lot of these are important organs to even live. So if we look at this, the body cavity where it says cranial, that's where the brain is housed. Without that being intact, well, the function or uh, being able to appropriately sense what's going on in the world is gone. So having that cavity intact is very important. The same thing with thoracic. Without having the thoracic cavity, what goes there? Well, we can think about the lungs, the heart. That's pretty important. And the abdominal and pelvic, well, we can might think about all the digestion right here. And then going more in the productive, we can think about urinary and re reproductive organs as well. So having a relative understanding of where these different cavities are are going to help us to think about all the different organs that are there and their vital roles as well. Now, these are the regions of the abdomen. Sometimes we see this in charts and uh, describing where the injury can occur or the inflammation or stuff like that might happen with this. So regions of the abdom abdomen is very important to understand. Now, there's a couple different ways of doing it, but regions are almost universal. You'll see this in 99.999% of places or a form of this. So this will just tell you quadrants. You see left upper quadrant, you see left lower quadrant, right upper quadrant, and right lower quadrant. Now, these are important to note. If you're facing them, we've got to reverse them, right? So if I'm looking, just because it's my left, it's actually their right. So we're going to have to keep this in mind. This is on the patient, not as we're looking at the patient. Now, we have the different regions of the abdomen, which are wonderful. And from there, we can then discover if there's a problem. Now, why are they seeing you at the doctor's office? Do you ever see patients that just love to see you like, hey, you know what? I was just in the area and I thought I would stop by for colonoscopy. No, you never hear that. People go to see a medical professional because they're in pain, there's abnormality, or they need answers to their questions. So we're going to discuss why there's, they're out of flux or something's going on. And that is homeostasis. So what is homeostasis? It's when the internal environment is functionally properly, is functioning properly, and all the organs and tissues of the body are performing their appropriate tasks. Simply put, this balance keeps you alive. So when you're sick, something's going on, you're out of homeostasis. Something's up. Something is going on. We need to be in homeostasis or put someone back as close as possible by way of diagnosing what's going on, and not us personally, but the medical team, and you're assisting with that. Also being able to have strategies to be put back in homeostasis and, and maintain it. So if you hear homeostasis, that's the most important thing. So a definition again, it's when the internal environment is functioning properly and all the organs and tissues of the body are performing their appropriate tasks. That's what makes you run. That's what's going to keep you healthy. That's what's going to keep you living for a long time. And we've got to explain that to our patients as much as possible in a way that they can understand. And not only for them to understand, but for them to benefit. So they're going to be doing tons of different activities. No one is alike. No two people are alike. So you've got to bring out the benefits of being in homeostasis. If there's someone that's an athlete, and they don't care about their health, well, explain, well, do you love that sport? Hockey, basketball, whatever, underwater basket weaving. You bring up, well, you can't be underwater with a scuba tank trying to do your basket weaving 
if you're all jacked up, right? So you're encouraging them in a way that makes sense to them. Don't relate to a patient if they don't care about a certain matter. Find a way for them to care about their health. Now, this is key. System interaction associated with disease conditions. Because the, the body is so dependent on multiple systems to function, when diseases and disorder develop, often multiple systems are involved. We're going to go through a couple examples later on, especially in week two. But keep in mind, the reason we're doing an integrated approach to the body is because the body shuts down if multiple systems are compromised. And all systems work together. So they can't stay off on an island by themselves. If something gets damaged, you're going to see a domino effect. So really, it's important to understand the multiple systems, how they go together, how they can affect things. And then you go from there. So with that being the case, we're going to be looking at a few other classifications in systems. Now, right here, we talk about tissues. And it says when cells of the same type of group together for a common purpose, they form a tissue. The main thing that we care about right here is the classification. And why we care about the tissue classification is because I want to know about connective nerve and muscle. Connective nerve and muscle. It's Specifically, this week, we're going to talk about the nerve and muscle section. Don't mind that. Someone is emailing me. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. I don't know why they're emailing me. Going on. We're going to start first with the nerves. Now, the nerve tissue is found throughout the whole body, and it serves as the body's communication network. So without having the nervous system working properly, the communication of what's going on in the outside world the sensory, the connection, all those things are lost. So it's important that the nervous system, the backbone of all the other systems, are, is working properly because it communicates with everything else. The next one is muscle. And that controls uh, basically what the brain tells it to do. So it says the tissue that can be controlled at will with impulses from the brain, the brain is part of the nervous system, it's called voluntary muscle tissue. It connected to bones of the body called skeletal or striated muscle. Now, those type of contractions the, made from that muscle tissue allows you to pick up a glass when you're thirsty. If you have an itch, you can scratch. All these things, voluntary. Involuntary actions occurs without control or conscious awareness are even more important. It deals with smooth and cardiac muscle. Um, We'll get into this a little bit later, but all the things that you don't think about, that's what involuntary muscle do does. So when you're thinking about blinking, guess what? That's what's important. Uh, important. If you're thinking about, well, when was the last time I really thought about breathing? Guess what? Involuntary muscles again. So we're going to look at the relationship with the nervous system and how important that is. Because without this, we would not last too long. And then the organs and systems. So the organs of the body are made of two or more types of tissue that work together to perform a specific body function. Organs of the body that perform similar, similar functions are organized into a body system. So that's why we look at the muscle system or muscular system, skeletal system, cardiac system, respiratory, they all have to do with a similar function or job and they work together. So you might see similar organs or organs that are close in proximity. They all work together to get something done. So we're looking at each organ, then the system, and then the hybrid, how they all work together. So we see from the cell, tissue, organ, system, and then the body. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's get into it. We're going to look at chapter 10, 13, and 14. So if you have your book, I recommend you taking it out. And we're going to be starting in a chronological order. We're going to start in chapter 10, 13, and 14. Now remember, I said this is going to layer on top of each other. So I would say first, watch this, and then make notes, and then go back into the chapters. So because there's going to be a lot of information, but once again, we did a hybrid lecture of the systems, so buckle up. So we're going to look at chapter 10, 13, and 14, 
And before we start anything, we have to look at what's important. Remember, we talked about system interaction associated with disease conditions. That's important. So the nervous system interacts with all other systems to control the body's functions. So what happens if the nervous system goes down? All the other systems are affected. So if there is a very severe trauma to the nervous system, other systems will be affected and you will not be able to control your body properly. Also, the pathos are found at the end of chapter 10. Uh, and then we can go in a little bit more detail, especially in the discussion questions. We can talk about different pathologies. So they're not going to be all listed in this chapter. Now, what we're looking at is we're going to look at a breakdown of different parts of the nervous system. But we're actually going to go ahead in one step further. It says the nervous system is broken down into two main divisions. And this is important to keep in mind. The central nervous system, it consists of the brain and spi spinal cord. That is it. Then the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, is everything else. It consists of nerves that connect the central nervous system to every organ and area of the body. So really, it's everything else. It's your limbs, it's your skin, it's everything. It goes everywhere. Central nervous system is only the brain and spinal cord. And what's very important to note is the central nervous system cannot grow back or regenerate the same way the peripheral nervous system can. The brain and spinal cord can adjust or get better over time, but it takes a lot of time and it doesn't regenerate completely like the peripheral nervous system. And we're going to see how we know that uh, through pathology and what that means for us as well. Now first, what we're going to look at, I'm going to go back. It says first, we're going to look at the probably the PNS because it has to do with all these other things that I want to get into. And before we do that, we're going to look at a picture. Now, this picture is basically represents how the information gets from one place to another. Now, we're going to, not going to ask you to memorize this chart, but really we're just trying to focus that there are many different things from all the way to the skin, the muscle, and everything else. When there's sensory and motor, that's what we need to keep in mind. Sensor first, when something touches you, there's a sensor. And there's a neuron that goes and basically tells your muscle and then it goes to your brain of interpreting feeling. And then the motor control or the motor, motor neuron can then come in and help. How do we mean this? Well, there's different types of sensation, correct? So a soft touch sensor, that might be nice. That might be a pillow. That might be something like a king size bed because you need a nap. Well, that sensory neuron is going to respond differently if there is a knife or a pin prick, correct? There's going to be different sensations. There's going to be a different response to that. So the sensory neuron is just as important as the motor neuron. Just because the motor, motor meaning moving or something, that's important. But to have a proper sense of what's going on is as just as important to know how to react to that. Now, I'm going to back up a few sections. Now, you see how it says central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord. We'll get to that in a second. Let's go into the peripheral nervous system. That's going to be that sensing what happens all over the body. So, where can we find this? Or how can we get this breakdown? Well, the autonomic nervous system, which is a branch of the peripheral nervous system, it is a part that controls internal organs and other self-regulating body functions. So basic functioning unit in the cell, and then there's three different types of neurons. The basic thing that we need to know is autonomic, means automatic, basically. Nervous system works and regulates itself without us needing to do anything. Okay, so this is one of the branches of the peripheral nervous system. You'll get the ANS, autonomic, and then you'll get SNS, synomic. We're focusing on ANS today because it's more important for us to focus on it 
for our field and to understand what's going on with patients at the moment. So autonomic helps with all that regulation. So if the, sen if the nervous system gets messed up in the peripheral nervous system, we might have problems regulating or being able to tell what's going on with body functions, which could make the nerves go haywire. Now, there's a couple effects of various substances that can change the speed of interpretation or reaction, and also it can mess up different things found in different organs that the nervous system innervates. Let's break that down. What does that mean? That means if alcohol is induced into the system and there's too much, it can slow down reactions. It can go to the cerebellum, which is part of the central nervous system, and mess things up. Also, the stimulus speeds up reactions. So remember, if you might think about, you've heard things in either movies or in books, they might say like uppers make you hyper, downers, which is alcohol, makes you down or slow down. So when you're looking at that, when there's stimulants such as coffee, caffeine, whatever, that can speed up reactions. Alcohol, it impairs it or slows it down. Depending on the disease, it can also wreak havoc on different contractions of the muscle groups. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Now we're going to look at a couple characteristics of the peripheral nervous system and spinal cord. Now remember, the spinal cord is going to be central nervous system. But anything that comes off of the spinal cord is going to be peripheral. So it says 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Guess what? That's PNS. The 31 pairs of spinal nerves found throughout the body, that's going to be, again, PNS. And then looking into this, it will say the two actions of the two divisions, the autonomic system, it brings it back again. So let's break this down. Let's make this easier. All of these pairs, all we need to know is if we see any spinal or cranial nerves, it's PNS. It's coming off of the central nervous system. It's in the peripheral nervous system. Done deal. Now, remember how we talked about ANS a second ago? ANS. Now they're talking about another section of the division of ANS. It says sympathetic nervous system begins at the base of the skull and runs down the spinal cord. These nerves extend to all the vital organs and blood vessels, the iris, the iris of the eye, and the sweat glands. What are they talking about? Why do we care about this? Basically, they're saying there is a system that activates fight or flight, means it gets your adrenaline pumping, it gets you to do something, or there is another section that makes you fall asleep and be able to digest. Remember we talked about yin and yang, about anterior, posterior? There's the same, same thing in the autonomic system. It tells you when to fight or run away, and then there's a time to slow down, take a nap, and digest. That is all it's saying. So, this is the other side. We saw we had sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic. So, both are off the ANS. You had sympathetic, parasympathetic. Para talks about contains the vagus nerves and the pelvic nerve, which are affected by emotions. And the vagus nerve extends to the brain and upper abdomen area. All we need to know is that this is the yin of that yang, parasympathetic and sympathetic. We'll talk about that later. Now, it talks about the main parts of the brain, everything like that, that's wonderful. But we're gonna take a break on that, okay? That's a lot of stuff right there. Let's switch for a moment, okay? Sorry, I was going ahead and making sure I was on target. And I am, so don't worry, don't freak out. I'm coming back for you guys. Don't worry, I was making sure I was on track. The main parts of the brain, all we need to think about right here, this is the central nervous system, okay? This is part of the brain. And if you notice, each part is highlighted in a different color, okay? And they do a different thing. So. The basics of this is right here, we have the frontal, and that is going to be responsible for more of emotions and rational thinking for the most part. The next part, parietal, we're going to be talking about language, 
and also interpretation in a minute. Okay, so making sense of words, symbols, everything like that. And then back here, we have the occipital lobe, which has to do with your vision and everything like that. So that's why if someone gets hit in the back of the head, they might see stars. That's because it's where the vision or the interpretation of vision is housed. Back here, the cerebellum, actually they call it the cerebellum being drunk because that alcohol, it can be basically filtrated right here. It affects the cerebellum, which means your balance goes a little bit haywire. You start seeing double. So back here is balance, vision, interpretation of language, art and symbols, and personality. Frontal, personality, parietal, more language and interpretation of symbols, occipital, talking about vision, cerebellum, talking about balance. Now we see right here a couple things that we talked about. Cerebellum controls sensory and motor activities and then divided into lobes. And that's cerebrum. That's going to be the, the upper half. Okay. We'll break it down later, but all we need to know is that's going to be the most superficial or closest to the skull. We'll put it that way. Then the frontal lobe is located behind the forehead located to emotions, personality, moral traits, and intellectual functions. And what we need to make an association with, if someone has a traumatic brain injury, a TBI, they check how the frontal lobe is doing. If someone has a TBI, they might be more emotional, they might have personality shifts, just by that being structurally damaged. Let's go back one second. Look at that little space we have in between the skull and then we have the brain right there. So having traumatic, a concussion, things like that, traumatic brain injury, these things can be affected. And this isn't solid like the skull. It's malleable, the brain is, so the structure can actually change. We can change the personality. That's why it's really important that we're having um, helmets, all these other things in these kind of sports because it, the front, frontal lobe is very susceptible to damage. Excuse me. The next one is occipital load, and that is in the far back portion of the cerebrum and associated with vision. And you gotta watch out for that because concussion or something they call a coup, counter coup, which just means the brain slams into the front part of the brain, then the back part of the brain, and then front again. So, real important. Associated with vision, so people can black out, they might lose vision if this is uh, damaged, and also a concussion can occur as well. Cerebellum, we talked about, responsible for smooth muscle, very important, digestion, muscle tone, and right there, coordination of sensory impulses. That's the coordination part. So if alcohol can impair it, we also have a lot of problems with it. The medulla oblongata adjoins the spinal cord. It influences the function of the heart, lung, stomach, secretion, and size of the openings in the blood vessel. So. If we look down here, the medulla right here, if this is damaged, we have basically function, involuntary function, that will be impaired. Now, if you look at this, this is going to be closer to C1, cervical spine 1. If this is hit, if we have a severing or if we get damage here, all the other system shuts off. Now, depending on where you get injured, if the medulla is hit, Say, for instance, we get a severing right here. If everything else shuts off, but the medulla is still intact, what does the medulla do? It influences the function of the heart and lungs and stomach secretion. So if the medulla oblongata is intact, there might be something, quote unquote, they call brain dead. The system might be still intact and doing other things. You're just not doing cognitive thought. The cognitive thought is not possible at that time. So... Uh, that is one working definition of brain dead. Uh, medulla oblongata is still working, but the other higher function things are not. So the body can still survive for a period of time, depending on the position and everything like that. Also, we're going to think about the pons. Well, no, we're going to talk about midbrain. 
Midbrain, we hear the word brain, that's kind of important, right? It's located superior to the, spawn, the pond and control center for reflexes, movements, pupil dilation of the eyes. So think about the location. These things are very close to the brain. If these structures are damaged, very important. We're going to skip to one more, uh, cisthalmus. You don't hear too much about this guy, but it's located between the cerebrum and the midbrain, and it acts as the relay station for impulses going to and from the brain. So this goes back to interpreting movement, interpreting uh, sensation. So if we go back a few, remember we were talking about the, all this, the skin, we might feel a pillow or we might feel a stabbing sensation. It goes through this cycle. The thalamus is going to intervene and tell the body, hey, is this important? Should we do something about this? If it's something simple, the thalamus will take care of it. If it needs to have higher thinking, it will go to the rest of the brain and then cognitive thought um, comes into play. Now this is happening microseconds, so don't think that this is happening for minutes. The thalamus is just a relay station to tell what's supposed to happen. The hypothalamus acts as a relay station as well for impulses going to and from the brain and those impulses from the uh, cerebellum and other parts of the brain. So hypothalamus helps out again. Hypo, where do you think it's going to be? Hypo, um, below. So hyper, um, usually above or we say supra, above. So we're going to different locations. Next one is cerebral spinal fluid, F, uh, CSF. That's going to be the cushion that deals with the shock or absorption in the central nervous system. So remember we talked about um, having whiplash, things like that. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid basically cushions the brain. It's floating a little bit. With this not being present, you can have a lot of problems in the spinal cord and also the brain. So it's important to have this continuous uh, fluid in your body for your central system, central nervous system to work properly. Now, later on, we wanted to throw in some diagnostic tests that you should be familiar with as well as an MA. Um, this is a CAT scan, and we need to know what it is. So it's a series of x-rays of the layers of the brain. It makes a three-dimensional picture. That's the main thing. So a CAT scan, we're dealing with the brain, three-dimensional. EEG. A brain wave test that measures the brain's electrical signals, both normal and abnormal. So dealing with different types of sleep disorders, sleep apnea, all these things, uh, it's important to get an EEG. Next one is EMG, electrical stimulation passed through small needles inserted into the muscle to demonstrate the electrical activity of the peripheral muscles. So this one determines if the person has neuropathy or is losing control or decreased sensation, the EMG, if they activate it to put the needles in the muscle and it doesn't contract, we know there's a problem, there's an abnormality, something's happening. Now, it talks about uh, this might have to do with diabetic neuropathy. There are tons of different syndromes that need to be tested by EMG, but if they're not responding correctly, now we're not getting the right sensation back to the brain to be able to make the changes. So EMGs are very important. Lumbar puncture, it's a spinal needle, it's a spinal needle and it's inserted into a small space in the lower back to remove small amounts of uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And it can help diagnose bleeding or infection and also can measure fluid pressure in the spine. So if there's an abnormality happening, they might have to do this. MRI, very common. It uses powerful magnetics to generate pictures. You see an MRI possibly after an x-ray. And it, the image can have numerous angles and it can, um, it can impart, it doesn't impart radiation. So what is this important? Possibly if the x-rays come back negative, they might have to do a closer look or at a different angle. MRIs come in and it might be able to make a better picture of what's going on with the patient. Ultrasound. It's the high frequency sound waves to obtain images inside the body. So uh, there are sometimes ultrasounds used. Once again, it can be diagnosing for uh, stroke, brain tumor, uh, blood flow, tons of different reasons for ultrasounds. And they're amazing. And the most basic we hear probably the most, x-rays. 
They help seeing what's going on with broken bones and be able to view uh, the different joints if they're intact as well and abnormalities. So if we see a compound break, a uh, spiral fracture, all those kind of things. Last thing that we need to hear about is uh, abnormal growth of tissue, which is a tumor, and it can occur anywhere in the body. So keep this in mind. Uh, there are different types of them, but we need to know uh, what they are. So abnormal growth of body tissue. Simply put, a tumor. So it can be different types. It can be cancerous in nature. Doesn't it can be benign? All these different things can be a factor. Okay, so those are the different portions that you'll see associated with the spinal cord and the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So why did we talk about this first? Why do we care? The reason is it has a direct impact to the skeletal and muscular systems of the body. So we're going to talk about the axial skeletal system, axial skeleton system, uh, and then epidicular skeletal system or skeleton. So made up of the spinal cord, skull, and rib cage, axial, the main section, basically. And then we usually call them the extremities, made up of the bones, legs, hands, feet, shoulders, and pelvis. And looking at this, we're also going to lay muscles on top of the same thing. So some muscles work in partnership with bones. It can control voluntary, um, can be controlled voluntarily by the motor nerves, going back to the nervous system, uh, the peripheral nervous system to achieve movements. So the peripheral nervous system plays a direct role in moving the muscles that are attached to the bones. Excuse me. Other muscles functions continuously without the slightest conscious concern. We'll talk about that later. The function of the muscles is posture. Muscles support the structure of the body. The uh, structure of the skeletal muscles protects the blood vessels and nerves that lie throughout the body. So it works together. And there's three types of muscle. Smooth, which basically is involuntary. It helps with digestion, all that kind of stuff. Skeletal is what it moves, you know, skeletal muscle moves, and then myocardial, it's the heart, heart muscle, okay? So, let's get down to basics. So, the basic one where we talked about the axle, it's all in blue. That's the main part. So, we have the skull, rib cage, spinal cord, and that's about it. The spinal cord is made up in three major parts, and we'll see that in a close up in a second. But the one dealing with the neck, that's cervical. The one in the rib area, that's thoracic. The one going down is lumbar. And then you have the sacrum and coccyx. Sacrum is a fused bone. And then coccyx, quote unquote, the tailbone. That makes up the axle. The, uh, basically, the appendages, the extremities are everything else. So you have the humerus, radius, and ulna. You have the carpals, and then you have the phalanges coming down. Well, carpals, metacarpals, and then phalanges. You have the pelvis, which is a major area that we need to know. Major. Iliac crest on the pelvis. Iliac crest, if we have trouble finding it, put your hands on your quote-unquote hips, and that's your iliac crest right there. Also, you have your femur, your patella, your kneecap. Then you have your tibia, which is your shin, quote-unquote. And then you have your fibula in the back. So these are the major ones that you need to know. Also, you have the clavicle and the scapula, the shoulder blades. These you hear the most, especially being in an office. Uh, you see a lot of damage when people coming in, either sports injuries or, you know, injuries that happen a lot. You'll see those areas. So we need to know those bones for sure. Femur, patella, tib, fib. Also in the back, the heel, which is the calcaneus. If we're worried about the joint, that's the talus down there that makes up the ankle joint. So just a few that we need to know. Also, something that lays on top of the bones, we now see all this muscle. But not to worry, we only had to worry about a couple. We have pecs right here, the deltoid. Now, why do we care about the deltoid? Well, if you're doing phlebotomy or you're doing injections, you're going to need to know where the deltoid is. So the deltoid is right here. It's built into three parts. 
Then we have also the abdominals, and those are made up of many different layers. Looking down in the lower extremity, we have the quads, and the quads are made up of four different muscles, but to keep in mind the one that we care about or the one that we can see the most time when it's contracting is the rectus femoris, and it attaches above the hip and below the knee. It's the only part of the quad, it's the only muscle of the quad group that crosses two joints. Then also, we have the calves going in the back, broken up into two. We have the gastrocnemius, and then underneath, the soleus. Um, and then, of course, we have the sternoclavoid mastoid, the SCM, we have to keep in mind as well. And then, those are about it for the muscles. We don't go too deep, unless you're going into physical therapy or something like that, but we need to know areas where palpation occurs, so we need to know for touch, and we also need to know for injections as well. So we see first the bones, and then we see the muscle. So we should be able to associate first bones and then go right into muscle and be able to go back and forth. Remember, we're not asking you to memorize all the bones just to forget them. You should have an association with the muscles as well. So major bones to consider and landmarks. We're looking at the skeletal. We're looking at skull, maxilla, and mandible. And mandible. So we're looking at the jaw. Maxilla, above, mandible, the jaw. We're looking at occipital and frontal. We'll take a look at those in a second. That's part of the skull. We talked about that briefly. Frontal, forehead, right here. Uh, and then a couple terms. Now, this was mentioned in midter uh, med term, medical terminology, but it's good to review Cervical spine, so CS is cervical, TS is thoracic, LS is lumbar, a lumbar spine. Pelvis, we talked about that. Hold on, getting ahead of myself. Calm down, calm down, doc. Pelvis, right here again. Uh, radius and ulna, ulna here, radius right there. Radius, remember, radiates, it goes over and, you know, turns over, makes pronation, supination. Ulna articulates with the humerus and it makes a hinge joint. And then iliac crest, we talked about it. Pelvis, we talked about SI joint. SI joint, uh, sacrum and ilium. So sacral, iliac basically connects. SI joint right here in the middle. Femur, we talked about it, the largest bone in the body. Your femur. And then your tib-fib, which are your tibia, your fibula, which is your shin, and then calcaneus, which is your heel. Stop if you need to take a break for a moment. If your mind is blown, pause this video and take five seconds, go around in a circle, get a drink of water, and then come back. We're about to talk about the functions of the skeletal system. All right, and we are back. This is the functions of the skeletal system. Remember, it has a lot to do with the muscles as well in the central nervous system. It supports the body, protects the vital organs. It's pretty similar to the muscular system, right? It does a lot of things. It provides a point for a muscle attachment, so they work together. It gives shapes to the body. Forms red blood cells. That's unique. They do that. Red, uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets and bones store calcium. So very important. Calcium has to do with strong bones, preventing osteoporosis, all that kind of good stuff. As well, it gives calcium which is needed for heartbeat, muscle contraction, and clotting. Now, we talked about it earlier, but here's a closer um, picture of the spinal column. Cervical, you have seven cervical vertebrae, C1 through C7, you have 12 thoracic, T1 through T12, lumbar, L1 through L5, sacrum, and then coccyx. So the breakdown of the spinal column. The skull, once again, we talked about it. There's many different parts, and we could spend an hour talking about it. But let's keep in mind there's a few things that we need to know. The frontal, front part, dealing with... Um, the brain, remember, it's, uh, it's got 
It has a certain lobe. Do you remember what lobe it was? Look back in your notes. I'm not going to tell you. Keep that in mind. That might be on test. Frontal lobe. Then we have the parietal. Uh, we also have the temporal. Temple. Temporal. Think about that. Uh, and then we have the occipital. Now, we're not going to talk about the sutures right now. But those are the major areas. Occipital, parietal, temporal, frontal. Okay. Also, keep in mind, we have a lot to do with zygomatic arch which basically means your cheekbone, if your zygomatic is broken, your cheek, nasal, important because of the nasal passage and the nose, maxilla above, mandible below. Mandible, if that's broken or impaired, think about eating. What would that do? What's the alternative? What would you need to change if the mandible is broken? Now, we have the rib cage. We talked about it. We see what also articulates with it, the clavicle, collarbone. And then we see this is important. Why? What if we do CPR and we miss? We do the xiphoid process instead. This xiphoid process, if it's actually broken during CPR, it can puncture a lung. So it's very important that we're actually going up higher on the sternum uh, and not on the manubrium, but right there on the sternum when we're actually applying pressure and we're having the right hand position. Very important. <clears throat> now, also connecting um, bones or different joints together. We have joints are found whenever two bones come together in the body to per excuse me to permit movement. So it articulates what wherever the joints are. Such as if you're if you look at an action figure and they move, that's what a joint does. It allows movement at those places. We also have different ways or different types of joints as well that we'll discuss later. Now, one of the things, this is touched in med terms, so I'm not really going to go into it a lot. But remember, keep in mind, if you forget your endings like itis, we're missing a lot of things. So anything with itis has to do with inflammation, bursitis, arthritis, all those things. you got to keep in mind. We've got to bring back those med terms. So you're going to see those again. Keep in mind, look in the, these chapters to look at the endings or prefix or suffix of the word to remember a couple of these things that you're going to be seeing again, over and over again. Carpal tunnel syndrome, we threw in a couple pathologies that you're going to see a lot, but it's talking about the compression of the median nerve. But remember, there's a difference between carpal tunnel syndrome, the exact definition, and carpal tunnel syndrome sy uh, symptoms. Okay, so carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms are different than the exact syndrome. What do I mean by that? Just because you're having these type of symptoms does not mean there's actually compression on the median nerve. So there's also alternatives to carpal tunnel. Also, if we look at osteoporosis, why is that so important? Because look at the difference what osteoporosis can do to the body. Totally different. This can cause kyphosis, which is the curvature of the cervical spine. What is it for low back? It's low, uh, it's low dorsis. And then if it's uh, curvatures in the thoracic spine and it's lateral moving, it would be scoliosis. So this is causing kyphosis. Now, the last part to keep in mind, why are we talking about this? Well, you'll be seeing patients that are rehabbing dealing with other injuries, and replacing bone and joints are inevitable when you go into any clinic. So when bone is destroyed by injury, cancer, or other infectious processes, providers may use bone taken from other places in the body. Replacing worn or damaged joints is a commonly performed procedure, and they can replace it with all different types. It depends on the doctor and their training. Um, or the surgeon's training, it's going to change. But keep in mind, replacing bones and joints might change how they act, how they wear and tear and make other movements, and also, also it changes the convex and concave nature of the structure. What does that mean? That means if you look at the anatomy of the body, it might change based on the surgery. So keep that in mind, it's always important to chart correctly, on the abnormality, on the repair of the joint and bones. And from there, you will see a difference and be able to clearly identify and re relay that message 
to the rest of the medical staff. So that is it. You made it. Give yourself a pat on the back. You made it through 57 slides. This is the hybrid version of Anatomy and Physiology Week 1 for Anatomy and Physiology. So thank you very much for joining. Let me stop this for a second. Woo! It has been a pleasure. A couple people came in and out of this chat. Um, you stayed up late for this, so thank you very much. We're going to repost this as well. Remember, email me at dwilliams at valley.edu. Again, that's dwilliams at valley.edu for more information. And also, I will be posting my email in the links below for this video. Thank you so much, and I look forward to working with you in week two of this course.